HBCU Digest Radio, welcome back uh, to another uh, in-depth conversation with uh, distinguished leaders and voices from the historically black college and university community. Today is a very, very special guest to me personally. Uh, he is the brother who is uh, the lead attorney um, and one of the distinguished legal voices in our country, uh, headlining a ongoing lawsuit uh, between stakeholders of Maryland's four historically black colleges against the state of Maryland. Uh, on the subject of program duplication and other matters. He is Michael Jones, a Dillard University alum, chair of that distinguished school's board. Uh, and again, here to talk with us today exclusively uh, about the case. And uh, Chairman Jones, first, I, I appreciate your time. It's an honor to talk with you for the first time in this, in this platform. Um, you were among three recent authors of an editorial in the Baltimore Sun uh, that called on Maryland Governor Larry Hogan uh, to do right by the HBCUs and to honor uh, a legislative uh, remedy to this law, this lawsuit um, in excess of five hundred million dollars to end more than, you know, 15 years of litigation. What prompted you guys to write this letter, especially given the the the, the period that we're in where so much cost is attached to a pandemic? Why now? and why that particular position on the HBCUs being supported in this way? Well, Jared, first of all, thank you for uh, having me on and, and thank you for that question. So let me just get right to the, the timing of it. Um, as you know, after the, uh, the essentially the televised execution of George Floyd, mm -hmm. uh, there's been a, a cascading demand for racial justice and and really a racial awakening uh, for many in the country. And in that context, the Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, uh, Boyd Rutherford, was interviewed uh, in an article in the Washington Post, and he cited to uh, these events surrounding George Floyd and said that, quote, we've reached a turning point in America, and it's time to address all issues of racism and inequality in all American institutions. And in that, uh, have, in that context, we then said, well, if you're going to make that statement, the best place to start is right in your own backyard with respect to the treatment of the four historically black colleges and universities in a 14-year lawsuit uh, dealing with academic disparities that the judge said were worse than Mississippi of the 1970s. So that was the, that was the context in terms of the... Uh, the the economic context of the of the recession, we also make the point that uh, this is since the HBCUs are already under resourced, this and and COVID nineteen has a disproportionate impact on Black families such as those at the HBCUs. This is precisely the time to fix this remedy rather than using the. COVID-19 as an excuse to do nothing. We also point out that there is no recession exception to remedying a constitutional violation. Right. Mississippi, Mississippi for example, started their uh, settlement payments, which are larger than those in Maryland, in the recession of 2000 and continued them through the Great Recession of 2008-2009. So this idea of they can't do it because of the recession is really just an excuse, especially when you consider, as we pointed out in the letter, uh, the governor allowed millions to go towards expanding thoroughbred racing in the state of Maryland. Let's talk about the legislative part of this, because it, it seems to me sure. that initially this, this would have, have appeared to be a veto proof agreement because of almost unanimous passage in both houses of maryland legislature that you know hogan could politically say i'm not signing it or you know i you know i override it but it was veto proof so do you think that the pressure is is appropriate on the governor or should it be shifted to those members who almost unanimously passed this legislation to say no hogan you're going to back down on this one well in, in fact both because the the last sentence of the the article was to say to the legislature they should uh, hold firm and override the veto. Uh, the challenge is that um, because of the, the coronavirus, the legislature had planned 
to have a special session in May, but they mm-hmm. cancel that special session, and they are still trying to assess when and how they can reconvene uh, to to vote uh, to override this veto as well as some of the others. Uh, so that it, it remains to be seen whether they will be able to come back in special session uh, or whether this will have to wait until the uh, January uh, w- when they are scheduled to come back in a regular session. So you're right that the pressure uh, is on the legislators from our point of view, but also on the governor and the lieutenant governor in particular, who is indicating that he's planning to run for governor uh, in 2022. Uh, so for the the schools need the money as soon as they can get it, frankly. So if if the governor would would reconsider and enter into a settlement on the terms of the legislation, we can do that before January. Otherwise, we may well have to wait until uh, the session starts in January if the legislature does not come back in special session before then. Do you think that's part of the play just to kick it down the road? I mean, because honestly, this is a this is a case that started two administrations ago. Uh, under Governor Ehrlich, uh, proceeded through Governor O'Malley, and now rests with Hogan. And every administration has found a way not to support the HBCUs, at least on this on the subject of this litigation. Do you think this is just a matter of him running out the clock, which seems absurd because he has so many years left in his tenure? But do you think that this is part of the play? Well, that that's the concern we have, but we weigh that against you know the the, leg, the legislative process you know, is slow, the judicial process is also very slow. So even if we, uh, if the courts decided the case uh, and and went back to the uh, district court to uh, appoint a special master and and to decide the specific programs and and the specific dollar amount, that process itself could take uh, a year or more. So the legislative process and a settlement is the faster approach uh if we can get maryland to do the right thing Let, let's talk about that court part of it and i do want to get to the background of the case itself for those who may not familiar because the thing about this case is it's 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 a landmark case uh but not too many including in the hbcu community know about it and know about the details but on the subject of this the remedy coming from the legislative body and not the court you know, I've heard in, in the circles and in, in being fortunate to be a Morgan grad and in Maryland that we didn't we didn't want this to go to the Supreme Court or have a chance to go to the Supreme Court. Is could you confirm that that was a consideration for your team uh, to try to, you know, contextualize the argument and say, well, let's let's get this settled now because we're not sure what the chances may be or what the what the culture may be if it were to advance to the highest court. Uh, first of all, as you know, uh, review in the Supreme Court is is entirely discretionary. Right. You'd have to file a, a petition for cert. Uh, and frankly, our analysis is that it is unlikely that the Supreme Court would take this case up mm-hmm. because, frankly, there are not. It's not like you have three or four other cases like this that are in the courts, and the courts have decided um, there's a split in the circuit. So the court, the Supreme Court needs to resolve it one way or the other. So that's that's a part of our analysis. Another part of our analysis also is that if we win in the fourth circuit, which we expect to do, mm-hmm. frankly, it's 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 hard to see that a uh, conservative Supreme Court uh, would be eager to uh, to give Maryland a break, frankly. Uh, especially, you know, uh, I don't know what the Justice Department position on this would be, but I can also envision, given the antipathy between Trump and uh, President Trump and Governor Hogan, that the Justice Department wouldn't be eager to weigh in on Maryland's side either. Mm. So I, I think in terms of, uh, as a, on the legal side, you know, what could happen is the Fourth Circuit uh, could rule, and then either side could ask for rehearing on bank by the full court of the Fourth Circuit, uh, and that could take a while as well. But I, I really don't. I, I our team is not persuaded that this is a case that the Supreme Court would take up. Let's talk about the case itself. So Maryland is a continuation of stuff like you know Ayers versus United States and Knight versus Alabama and Tennessee uh, on the subject of UT Nashville. 
none of the HBCU <laughs> communities or uh, HBCU stakeholders have ever lost a case like this, or at least lost it outright um, on the subject of of uh, improper funding or or program duplication. Um, with that record, why do you think it takes so? How could you explain it to laymen like me why it took so long to get here? If every other case which preceded it seemed to say, you're right, you got to stop treating these black colleges so poorly. Well, a couple of things. One, when you see every other case, there have only been, I think, three cases, right? right? So it's not like there, there are 100 or 50. Right. So the three cases, and what's different about this case, uh, one of the ways that this case is different, this is the only case that's ever been brought entirely by private litigants mm -hmm. in Mississippi. And in Louisiana, you have the Justice Department uh, that got involved. Mm -hmm. and, and you would really have to talk to uh, the Justice Department people under the past three administrations as to why they did not get involved in the case. We had meetings with, with them. Um, so that part of it is, is, is a difference that it's the Justice Department is, is at least up until to this point, has not been involved in the case. The second is that uh, each case is factually different because the courts look at, like, what are the current policies and practices in the jurisdiction and whether they are traceable to the de jure era uh, and whether that has, you know, um, this segregative effects is the, legal, is the legal standard. So in Maryland, it did enter into an agreement with the Office of Civil Rights in 2000, at the end of the Clinton administration, and it made certain promises as to what it was going to do, some of which it in fact did, but uh, some of which it didn't do. So that was a way that it also distinguished itself from the uh, from the other cases. Uh, and so we had a, um, the case went to trial in 2012, just in terms of the timeline, with the trial in 2012, mm -hmm. a six-week trial, and the district court issued its opinion um, a year later in 2013. The district court ordered the parties to mediation again, which was, I believe, our second mediation. And those mediations lasted a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so the court, after the mediation failed, the court held a, another trial in 2017. Uh, and so that trial lasted uh, seven weeks. And after that trial, um, the parties were ordered again to mediation, um, and, and that mediation was unsuccessful. We then uh, went to briefing in the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit, after oral argument, uh, sent us back down for uh, further mediations, and those mediations failed. And so one of the reasons why I decided that we should engage the legislature is that what was happening is the mediation itself is confidential. So essentially the governor and his representatives were saying one thing in the mediation and they were saying another thing publicly, right. including to the legislature. So we decided let's let's just bring it out in the open, let's get the legislators involved, which is one of the things that the Fourth Circuit uh, judges had actually suggested that the media the, the legislature should get involved to settle the case. Uh, so let me just say that, you know, this has been 14 years, but yeah. the Mississippi case was actually longer than that in right, terms of right. getting getting it resolved. It went up to the, uh, to, you know, to the higher court and back down to the district court. And one of the reasons why these, you know, these things take so long, frankly, is that um, when, whenever you are looking to upset the status quo and try to change the hierarchy of, of higher ed institutions, you know, that's not anything that the, the state is, is interested in doing or willing to do. Um, you know, the truth is they should, because it's not like you were talking about, uh, we want $500 million to go to private individuals. Right. These are state schools, right? So the, the money is going to be invested uh, in state schools, and it will be ultimately, and the courts get this, It'll be ultimately for the benefit of of the state of everybody, for everybody. Right. But but if you think about it, if if the HBCUs all of a sudden are more attractive to a certain extent, that's a threat that's to right. the traditionally that's white right. institutions. Let, let's talk a little because bit. Right, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't sure. mean to cut you off. 
Well, because, you know, one of the things that was was p- pretty clear in the trial was that all of the presidents of the traditionally white institutions testified that they don't consider the HBCUs as recruiting peers to them. They're not recruiting competition. Right. This could help change that. That's right. And and, and that's the point I wanted to hit it on, because the, at the core of the argument of you guys argument was, you know, the state has created hundreds of unique programs at predominantly white institutions in comparison to at the time about, you know, just over 10 uh, at HBCUs and that those attractive and unique programs is what has has shaped enrollment trends and has shaped racial demographics at these schools. So if that if that is at the core of it, do you do you think that this this settlement, if, if Hogan was to say, all right, fine, you got it, you got it tomorrow, that that resolves it? Or is this a foundation for larger conversations about what comparability and competitiveness look like for HBCUs? Well, it's it, it's a starting point. Uh, the the settlement agreement and the legislation as well sets out what the funds are going to be used for, and and, and it's first and foremost the establishing of academic programs. And as a judge ordered uh, to give those programs a chance of succeeding by providing funds for marketing, scholarships, and and financial aid. Uh, in in terms of comparability and competitiveness, and this is the conversation that I. I have with the clients uh, very often to talk about the unfortunate limitations of the civil rights law. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, the, the same forces that created the inequities largely shape what the laws are. Mm-hmm. And the civil rights laws don't like anything that sounds like, smells like, you know, looks like reparations. <laughs> so right. you have you, you have to so you have to frame the case in a different way. I mean, as, as Marilyn put it, if the case was just about past discrimination, you know, we wouldn't have to have a trial because they admit to past discrimination. They, they admit that publicly in public documents for public consumption and political appeasement, they have said that they would remedy past discrimination. But in court, they rightly point out that they have no legal obligation simply to remedy past discrimination. You have to jump through these hoops of four dice of, of pointing to uh, current policies that are traceable to the de jure era that have segregative effects, uh, which is, you know, is quite a hurdle to have to jump through, whereas in other aspects of the law, you know, I do a lot of corporate defense work and one of the things that plaintiff's lawyers like to say, which is, is, you know, it is well known that if you make a mess, you have to clean it up. Clean it you up, can't right. pollute it. You can't pollute a river and walk away and saying, okay, from now on, I'm going to be more careful. Mm-hmm. Um, the law doesn't contemplate that. But mm-hmm. in this context, the law contemplates that as long as you um, go forward and you change your policies. You don't have to clean up the mess that you make unless the lawyers can tie it to a policy that's traceable to the de jure era and that has segregative effects. Which you guys successfully did. And Correct. Yeah. It it and just one more question on the case itself. We know the the value of the students and the alumni um being aware and being vocal about the case. But one of the interesting wild cards in the case has been the presidents. And here in Maryland, at our four HBCUs, those positions, with the exception of the leadership at Morgan State, have turned over um, a few times <laughs> at each of the other institutions since the, since the case was, was first filed. What, what is the role of presidents in advising your team um, in responding to legal inquiry about the merits of the case and what should be done? Well, the, the plaintiffs in the case are is the Coalition for Equity and Excellence in Higher Education, which is made up of students, students and alums, at, at the right. HBCU, students, alums, faculty members. And, and uh, so the schools themselves are not uh, plaintiffs. In fact, the schools are not represented by us. The schools are represented by the state of Maryland. Right. Uh, and so... Because of that, you know, one of the things that the state did was to refuse to allow the presidents to meet with us 
to help craft a remedy. Uh, you know, uh, there was a time when we were focusing on trying to identify the specific academic programs that would go at each of the schools. Mm -hmm. But the state made that very difficult, uh, as I said, by refusing to let the president meet with us and, and by not giving the president accurate information as to what, uh, what they were supposed to be doing and crafting their own remedy. I mean, the truth is, it's a conflict of interest because the state represents both the HBCUs and the traditional white institutions that have differing interests. Right. Uh, so the answer is that we have been able to talk with the president only really in the context of the mediation in the presence of the, um, of the, of the state. We don't have direct communications with the president because that's not allowed. Mm. Let's talk about you personally. Uh, you're an HBCU graduate. Uh, you're a partner at an influential firm. When this case first came to your attention, what was your excitement level, interest level, and and did you recognize that if I take this on, I'm going to be a part of of a lineage of of great civil rights litigation and action? Well, th thank you for that question. Now, this here is the context. This case came to me in 2009. Uh, I was on the uh, uh, board member of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights got involved in the case, and they were looking for a law firm to uh, to handle it, and they knew that um, I was uh, an, a graduate of an HBCU, so approached me about it. And I was, I was interested, I was intrigued by it, uh, and when I started looking at the documents and, and understanding the case better, I, I really and truly couldn't believe it. It was outraged because I always thought about, you know, as many people do, you think about Maryland as a blue state, right. uh, kind of, kind of lose, lose track of the fact that it was a slave state. In fact, the, some of the most um, prominent uh, h historical figures from Maryland were folks who were had escaped slavery, um, you know, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. And we also knew that um, that that Thurgood Marshall was from Maryland, but Thurgood Marshall had actually sued the state over its its uh, segregation policies. We learned that Maryland had some of the earliest and most restrictive segregation laws in the country. Mm -hmm. You know, frankly. So as, as I looked at the documents, um, it was also clear to me that one of the things that you know had been going on. We talked earlier about the you know, politics, and you mentioned the different uh, administrations that have kind of come and gone. In that, the uh, politically, the, uh, the the various gubernatorial administrations had been uh, pointing the fingers at each other. You know, uh, Ehrlich was in office; he vetoed a bill that was passed by the legislature that would have protected the schools from unnecessary program duplication. Then O'Malley. Got involved, uh, became governor. We negotiated with him. That went nowhere because he was pointing the finger at Ehrlich that he was doing more than Ehrlich did. And when Hogan got in, it was the same thing. He was pointing the finger at Ehrlich and you know uh, um, at, at, uh, at O'Malley, uh, O'Malley. Right. <laughs> and, and he, he he did more than O'Malley did. Right. <laughs> that he did more than O'Malley did. And and frankly, um, I I think though publicly they were saying things that were palatable to folks uh, who weren't in court and hearing the arguments that they were making and how essentially they were denigrating the schools um, as, as saying that, you know, it really isn't worth, you know, making this kind of investment, you know, in them. Right. So I, I was, you know, was and have been, you know, very excited about the case and um, I do, as you, you indicated, see it as the continuation of the, you know, the, the great civil rights work by uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall and others. You've been a part of it for 11 years. Um, the case is in excess of 15 years old. Uh, who knows how much longer we'll be uh, without a legislative remedy. At what point do you look at it at yourself personally and the, the plaintiffs who are involved? The, you know, my president, Earl S. Richardson from Morgan State, President Emeritus. And say, you know what? I want this to be done because these brothers and sisters who waited all this time deserve to see a finish to what they started. Because we can't, you know, 20 years 
you know, Lord, <laughs> heaven forbid, someone won't be here. Um, you know, but th- is that is that a factor for you that you look at so many people who are involved and so many people are so hopeful about this and say we got to get this done so they can see this take place? Well, it, it let's look at it in this way. Uh, we pro- we could get it done today. It could have gotten it done you know, uh, a month ago, six months ago, if we had been willing to accept the governor's take it or leave it offer, which was two hundred million dollars. Uh, both we and the, and the the plaintiffs, the lawyers, and the uh, the students and the faculty and alums recognize that two hundred million dollars <laughs> divided by four schools is fifty million dollars, and that's not really going to that's not going to make a difference. And over so over ten over ten old. years at that, and you are you over, are so much more eloquent years. than so, those of us who said get the f out of here with that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, 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 over ten years. Right. <laughs> That it's, it's not going to be it's not going to be significant, and right. so the issue is, you know, do you throw in the towel essentially? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think a part of their strategy was thinking that essentially we would throw in the towel, and you know we haven't so far, and 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 don't plan to. Um, and so the issue is at this point, the the only, um, at least as we see it, the only alternative is to keep fighting, you know, and and that strategy, you know, has to be a strategy of what I call, you know, litigation, which which we are doing, um, and agitation and having, you know, people write to the the legislators, write to the to the governor and, and when circumstances allow, have other rallies as we as we've had in the past. Uh, really, to put pressure on the um, on on the people who are con- making the decisions. And then the final question again: um, you honor us for sure with your time and your insight today. But the final question is: so many states, unbeknownst to a lot of folks in the HBCU community, have looked at this case. This is a this is a litmus for things that they'll be able to do in their respective states on the question of program duplication, uneven resources. Uh, willful direction of, of racial demographics from different school to school. Um, Pennsylvania, South Carolina are two two states that I know in recent years that have cited the Maryland case to say, you know, if y'all don't act right here, we can do what they did in Maryland. Um, do do you expect that even when this is done, even when this is settled, that you'll still be getting calls from states all over the country saying, "Come teach us." On how on on how you did this because the same thing is happening here. You know, I actually do expect uh, that to be the case. I also, Jared, expect that um, people will be looking at lawyers will be looking at, and we ourselves are thinking about uh, a wide range of areas in which HBCUs are discriminated against. Mm-hmm. You may have seen articles that talk about how. HBCUs have to pay more on the bond for bond, yep. bonds. Yep. Yeah, e- even when you control for credit worthiness, HBCU students uh, have to pay more for uh, higher interest rates for loans, and and there are all number of of areas where HBCU students, HBCUs, black people uh, have to pay more, pay higher property taxes. So I I think that. Uh, especially in this time of a racial racial awakening, uh, I, I think these issues are going to come under uh, sharper focus. Just as we, you know, with renaming uh, you know, pancake mixes mm-hmm. and football team names, and I, I think that a, a reexamination of so much, so many of the things that, frankly, we have just accepted and taken for granted, um, I think it's going to be a new day. But that, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. You know, we're going to have to, just as we're doing in this case in Maryland, you know, we've got to roll up our seeds and put our um, shoulder to the to the wheel and put the investment and time and resources to uh, to make change happen.